So to begin, we can start with microcytic anemia. The most classic cause is iron deficiency. And on your screen now, there's a picture of what these microcytic hypochromic red blood cells look like. Hypochromic just means that they tend to be very pale appearing. So very pale appearing, small red blood cells should be very concerning for iron deficiency anemia. The next type is alpha thalassemia. Now, alpha thalassemia is a defect in the alpha globin chain. So if you remember, hemoglobin is actually made up normally of two alpha chains and two beta chains. Now, alpha thalassemia results in a mutation in the gene for the alpha chain. So actually, you end up receiving two alpha chains from your mother and two alpha chains from your father for a total of four alpha chains in your chromosomes. So four alpha chains. The degree of severity of the thalassemia depends on how many alpha chains actually have mutations in them. So if you only have one or two of your four alpha chains affected, it tends to be either an asymptomatic or a very, very mild anemia. If there are three of the alpha chains affected, you get something called hemoglobin H disease, which is a very chronic, severe hemolytic anemia, which can result in the need for chronic transfusion therapy. And chronic transfusion therapy can result in iron overload, and a disorder called hemochromatosis, where you get iron overload in several of the major important organs. If all four of the alpha genes are deleted or disrupted by mutation, that's not compatible with life, and you actually get a disease called hemoglobin Bartz. Hemoglobin Bartz is actually made up of four different types of gamma chains, and gamma hemoglobin is usually a component of fetal hemoglobin, but if you have only fetal globin, so if it's four different gamma chains and nothing else, that's not compatible with life, and that's what you tend to see if you have a complete deficiency of the alpha chain. So that's alpha thalassemia. The other type of thalassemia is beta thalassemia. Now, in beta thalassemia, you only have two types. There's either beta thalassemia minor, which is a heterozygote, or there's beta thalassemia major, which is the homozygote. Now, in beta thalassemia minor, these patients are usually asymptomatic because having just one good copy of the beta gene is usually enough. The way you do confirm this diagnosis, however, is by checking for a type of hemoglobin on electrophoresis called hemoglobin A2. Now, hemoglobin A2 is a hemoglobin composed of two alpha chains and two delta chains. So it's alpha 2, delta 2. Normal hemoglobin in a normal adult without thalassemia tends to be alpha 2, beta 2, as we already said. So in these patients with beta thalassemia minor, instead of seeing alpha 2, beta 2, you see alpha-2, delta-2 at a much higher level. And that's just because there isn't quite as much beta chain around. But again, these patients are generally asymptomatic, do not require treatment. On the other hand, beta thalassemia major are the homozygotes. Now, this is where the beta chain is completely absent. And without any beta chain at all, you develop a very severe anemia requiring multiple transfusions and, again, very high risk of iron overload and hemochromatosis over time. Another classic finding that's sometimes tested on the USMLE step one is that these patients with beta thalassemia major, and actually patients with sickle cell as well, can present with this crew cut appearance on an x-ray of their skull. And what's basically going on here is that in the bone, you have areas of ramped up hemoglobin synthesis, ramped up red blood cell synthesis, where it normally doesn't occur. And so with that extra red blood cell synthesis in the bone marrow, sometimes the bone can start to look weird in certain places. And the skull is one example of that and they get this very flat top crew cut appearance on the x-ray of the skull. And so the last type of microcytic anemia we need to discuss is called sideroblastic anemia. And we already mentioned this briefly. If you remember, it was the very first step of the heme synthesis pathway that was affected by sideroblastic anemia. Now that's the genetic form. Now there's also reversible forms that can be caused by either alcohol poisoning or lead poisoning. And if you do encounter someone with high levels of alcohol or high levels of lead, you think they have sideroblastic anemia, just removing the lead or the alcohol should fix the problem. And if you remember, people with a genetic form of sideroblastic anemia, they basically have a defect in that ALA synthase gene, and the only way to help the reaction go forward is to give them vitamin B6. Now, the other important diagnostic clue for sideroblastic anemia is that you see what are called ring sideroblasts. And there's a picture on the screen now of what these look like. They look like exactly what the name sounds like. It's basically a ringed appearing cell, and it looks very different from the other red blood cells that are present. You can also see in this picture, there is some basophilic stipple in there as well, which we said can occur with lead poisoning, and sideroblastic anemia can also occur with lead poisoning. So it's pretty fair to guess that this slide came from somebody with lead poisoning. And on the next picture, you can see here's a good example of uh, basophilic stippling seen in lead poisoning.
So, as we said, sideroblastic anemia can be caused by lead poisoning. So let's talk a little bit more about lead poisoning. There are some common clinical manifestations, some of which we already discussed, but there are a few others we should make note of here that could show up on USMLE Step 1. The first is that you can see lead lines on the gingiva, so the gums, okay, and also on the epiphyses of the long bones. Now, lead lines are exactly what they sound like. You just see these linear patterns of disruption, either on the gums or on the x-rays of the long bones. Lead poisoning also leads to an encephalopathy, which we discussed, so memory loss, attention deficit, etc. It leads to abdominal pain and sideroblastic anemia, which we already discussed. And often, especially with adults, you'll see a peripheral neuropathy, and this can result in a wrist drop or a foot drop. Treatment, as we already mentioned, for first line is EDTA, a molecule that is a chelator of lead. And also, for kids, we sometimes use succimer, which is another lead chelator. Easy way to remember that is that you can say, it sucks to be a kid who eats lead. Easy way to remember, it sucks to be a kid who eats lead. So succimer is used to treat lead poisoning in kids.